right? Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. So. And you see the right one, right? Yeah, I can see the right one. Perfect. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the first talk of our workshop at RSS. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I will have a quick introduction. Um, uh, first, it's always our great pleasure to have Marco Hooter today. He's an assistant professor for robotic systems at ETH Zurich and co-founder and board member of Antibiotics. He obtains all his degree from ETH Zurich and his research interests are developing novel machines and actuation concepts together with underlying controller planning and learning algorithm for locomotion and manipulation. His work have found many applications from electrically actuated quadrupedal robots, such as animal and large scale autonomous excavators. So we are eagerly looking to your talk, Marco. Thanks a lot, Farbot, for the introduction. Also, thanks to all the RSS organizer uh, for having me here. Um, so as the title says, I would like to show you a little bit in how we're using real-time optimal control or better uh, MPC for locomotion and manipulation. And I will particularly focus on these quadrupedal systems. Um, it's not that we're only working with quadrupedal systems, but I think these belong to the most generic um, uh, robotic systems out there and at the same time also uh, some of the most challenging ones. And that's why I will highlight a couple of elements on real-time optimal control in the context of quadrupeds. Uh, as Farbot already mentioned, I've been working on quadrupedal systems for almost a decade, um, developing some of the first quadrupeds at ETH, and now since a couple of years, we're also commercializing them uh, through antibiotics. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen these machines in, in real, they're roughly like uh, dog-sized 40 kilo uh, gram machines equipped with uh, tons of different sensors to perceive the environment, to make them autonomous. And they're also very robust and rugged to, to work in um, some of the most challenging outdoor environments. Now, what is important for this presentation here is that they are driven by these actuator modules that you've just seen in, in this bottom right video, which are serious elastic actuators that on one side really allow us to do pretty precise joint torque control of the machine. And by that also abstracted as a uh, torque controllable multi-body dynamic system that we then use uh, in our MPC uh, formulations. Uh, the machines themselves, uh, we're using them in a variety of different applications ranging from uh, industrial inspection maintenance works to construction site monitoring for like build status observation or safety uh, regulations. Um, I would like to draw your attention here to the top left video to explain you this a little more in detail. Here you see uh, animal, the, the B version, so like two generations ago uh, during the uh, DARPA sub competition, doing an autonomous exploration of an underground area in a nuclear power plant. You can see here on the bottom right in how the, the map is filled up uh, of the environment. I see here on the bottom left, and how the, the robot maps its local terrain that is then used um, for planning the individual footholds and the bottom right, essentially the volumetric representation of the environment that allows us to do, uh, identify what are the directions of whether uh, I can gain most new information and then explore in these directions for like fully autonomous exploration missions. Now in all these uh, uh, scenarios, what the machine has in common, and that's not only for our machine, but also for many others, is that we can approximate this using uh, with a like torque controllable multi-articulated system. And that holds for the walking machine, but also you can extend it with an arm uh, for uh, manipulation. Now, since this workshop is more about optimal control and probably not all of the people are experts in, in legged systems or quadrupedal systems, I would like to do here a little detour in explaining you in how we're controlling uh, such machines in general. So it starts on the highest level with a uh, high level navigation planner that essentially tells the robot the directions, what kind of velocity it should move, uh, where it can move. We then have a planning level. Uh, this planning level is the, the optimal control part where we do plan the motion of the system, its footholds and uh, the reference equation. Um, by looking ahead, like very short time horizon, very short planning horizon. The third layer is then a tracking controller, typically implemented as a whole body um, 
controller that is often uh, uh, inverse dynamic space methods uh, with a hierarchical QP that allows us to follow the plan while satisfying a number of constraints which you may have not modeled in the planning level and also include a couple of reactive behaviors. And then on the lowest level, you obviously have joint torque control, which is also implemented on each individual joint. And there's two feedback loops. One is on the proprioceptive um, sensings like joint positions, IMU contact sensors to do state estimation. And there's an exoceptive feedback loop, which is used for localization and mapping. Now in this talk, I will exclusively concentrate on this planning aspect. Um, if you look at these three blocks up here, we uh, understand that like joint control typically happens in the several tens of kilohertz uh, range on the joint module itself. The tracking uh, whole body controller is typically implemented in the orders of uh, kilohertz. And that's like common also uh, with many other robots, whether it's humanoids or multi-legged systems. And then you have the planner, which is typically in the several tens to hundreds of hertz. Uh, implemented. Now in here, of course, you have to do quite a bit of trade-off between what kind of model complexity can I afford to make the plan be as well followable as possible. At the same time, you want to have a fast execution of, of this um, planning algorithm such that if you have a disturbance or if you're not following your plan exactly, you can do a rapid uh, replanning. The two main challenges in here is that we are combining for legged systems, we're combining a continuous uh, problem of the motion together with a discrete uh, problem of the foothold. So where to step, and when to step. And actually it's even a combinatorial problem uh, in what sequence in which uh, feet will, st uh, will step. We will not look at this at all uh, today. So all our implementation essentially start from a given gate sequence, a given order, then only optimize uh, when and where uh, these footholds will take place. Now, in a classical setup, what researchers have been doing is typically like breaking up this optimization problem. So we start, as I said before, from uh, a high level, um, an oracle or a human operator that says, like your machine should move with this or that gate that defines the sequence of each individual foothold. Given the sequence in a second step, in this first optimization, we're optimizing for the location of each foothold. So what happens here is that given a certain velocity and how we'd like to move, we're typically um, extrapolating where the robot should step based on relatively simple templates and the inverted pendulum models or something like this. Additionally, if there's disturbances to the system, you obviously adapt your foothold accordingly. And then you have certain hard constraints, so like uh, reachability constraints uh, with your feet, you may want to avoid self collision. So you project that back into whatever is feasible to achieve. And all these optimizations, they run extremely fast uh, on board the road. Now, given these footholds, then in the second step, we have already defined what is the support polygon, and you can do a motion optimization. So what people very often do here is that uh, we understand if we have support areas, support lines, we know that the uh, uh, the center of pressure has to be within the support polygons lines. And hence, I can do a very simple CMP model where I optimize for the motion of the base given uh, these uh, constraints in order to generate how the system is supposed to be moving. And you can even like linearize that very often because you're moving more or less uh, with a steady height of your main body. Now, what you see here is implemented in uh, tons of different uh, legged systems. And actually, it works uh, pretty well. However, there is a lot of buts, and uh, people don't often talk about these buts in the papers. Um, first of all, it requires quite a bit of uh, manual tuning, in particular because you have these two separate optimizations, and both of them highly depend on the gate and on the model. If you change something there, you have to literally like, retune every single element. You do quite a bit of model approximation. Uh, and these model approximations are becoming very inaccurate if you go for rough and highly inclined terrains where they actually want to go with a uh, legged like robot, otherwise you should take wheels. And also it's pretty limited in, in terms of what kind of uh, limitation or what kind of constraints you can include, like reachability, collision checking, and so on and so forth. 
and sensitive to model changes. And think about the problem, uh, what should we do here if we add an arm? So all of a sudden, like all these approximations we were doing are just completely off. And it's very hard to come up uh, with a similar setup but that includes manipulation as well. So this has motivated us that we essentially formulate a framework that brings all of that uh, together. So you would like to unify a uh, multi-contact optimal control problem for dynamic locomotion and manipulation. And I will use this and in particular the work of uh, Jean-Pierre Simon, um, that was recently published at uh, ICRA, in order to guide you through some of the elements that I think are important in this context of uh, real-time optimal control. And then in the second part of the work, give you uh, several other works and ideas and how we can improve or change. So what is important in here, we want to encode contact making and breaking events. And we do this with a switch system framework. Uh, we still want to use templates, so simplified model descriptions. But these templates have to be complex enough that they can capture base, the arm, and also all the couplings between the arm and the base, and even like the coupling with the environment. You want to encode both robocentric and object-centric tasks. So if you want to move something at your end effect or you move the base, and you want to do this in one single cost function, it allows us a very simple switching uh, of the behavior. And lastly, you'd like to have the whole setup to really properly handle all the system's physical constraints. Now, the underlying method that we're using here is um, the OCS2 platform, which is a C++ library for efficient uh, optimal control implementation. Uh, so the algorithm there is a sequential linear quadratic technique, which is some sort of continuous time differential dynamic uh, programming variant that uses uh, linear approximations of the dynamics. I will not talk about details in here because we have a dedicated tutorial by Farbot at this exact RSS workshop on July 13. But what this framework essential is doing, we are uh, optimizing this, uh, we, do, we solve this finite time optimal control problem with objective subject to dynamic constraints. And we have a number of state input equality constraints that we include as uh, through Lagrangian method, a number of state only equality constraints for penalty method and the last inequality constraint, which are often like used uh, uh, included through the X barrier functions. Uh, if you're interested in, in more details here, also there's a recent work from our group which combines these two or replaces these two with an augmented uh, Lagrangian that allows us to improve the numerical conditioning and also for tightening some of the feasibility regions. So if you have this solver, the first thing you have to look at is what kind of model complexity do we actually uh, want to include? What people have been doing historically, as I showed you at the beginning, was like inverted pendulum, uh, inverted spring-loaded pendulums and stuff like that, which is clearly limited. What is today probably the most commonly used uh, model is the so-called uh, single rigid body dynamics uh, model. Some, of, some people have renamed this to potato model. But what this does, in essence, is you just take all the inertia of your moving limbs and the mass of your moving limbs, and you lump them together to one single uh, body. And you assume that the influence of moving limbs uh, to this single body is negligible. Now, that was obviously is true uh, if you have very lightweight legs, which most of the quadrupeds are designed for. So the mass matrix in here essentially just varies with respect uh, to the base orientation only. Now, obviously, this is not fine, okay anymore. If you add an arm that does a lot of dynamic maneuvers that has a certain weight and certain payload capacity to move around uh, large masses. So this would be just uh, uh, wrong in that sense. So what you're doing in this case is that we're modeling the complete systems using full central dynamics together with uh, the full kinematics where we have the variation of uh, including um, the base orientation, but also the joint positions. And there we have also this coupling momentum that comes in through the motion of each individual segment that is moved. It can be from the legs, but can also be primarily from the arm, which is a, a lot heavier. Now, given then the model, 
Second element we have to worry about is the system constraints. We start with a fixed sequence, so kind of a predefined uh, contact schedule. And there's two types of constraints we have to worry about or include in here. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the equality constraints. And all of them, all these constraints are pretty much defined on the contact level, which can be either open or closed. So you have here the first constraint, which says like the feet of the stance leg are not allowed to slip, so they have to have zero velocity. And for the swing legs, you want to track a certain uh, reference motion. And you have a uh, zero grip or object relative velocity. So you want to move the object around with your end effector. And then the last element is that whichever contact is open is not allowed to produce a, a contact force. And then the right hand side, we have all the inequality constraints, which include, for example, velocities, uh, velocity limitations of the arm which include the torque limitations that we have, and which also include some friction cone constraints at the feet. Now we have to combine this with the tracking part. So we have here in the top block, we have this SLQ-based planning uh, part, which generates the reference motion and also some reference uh, forces. Now we have to track this. And there is a couple of changes that happen here during tracking. So most importantly, we are not tracking the interaction forces at the feet. But instead, what we're generating is the reference motion of the base. And then we track this reference motion of the base. And that has shown to be much better, like in reacting with different types of uh, environments. And you have um, tracking constraints for your feet. So you want to track uh, your arm joint on a certain constraint. And then the last element, and this is different now to the feet, whatever you're interacting with your arm, because you don't know the model of what we're interacting with, uh, there we, we really track the force at this end effect. Now let's move on to the experimental part. Uh, for this, we first have to define what is the, the right cost function uh, to achieve a certain behavior. So we came up with this essentially cost function that combines costs for the end effector part, so reference motions of the end effectors uh, in rotations, and same for the base and the joints, then uh, for interacting with objects, and depending on what type of behavior you want, so whether you want to have a free motion behavior or uh, free motion uh, at the end effector tracking and then or object manipulation, you change in these weighting factors of these individual contributions. And that serves uh, as the cost function for all the experiments we were doing in this work for um, like opening doors, manipulating the environment um, in all kinds of different uh, scenarios. So let me quickly um, jump through them. Uh, first thing here is like just moving around uh, while having a cost that says like your arm should not move. So obviously here this behaves in like just this data model. Uh, we've seen before, we have one lumped mass, the arm does not contribute to momentum of the system, and the whole balancing happens through the locomotion. We can then relax, we have, we can make the arm move as well. So depending here on what kind of uh, reaction you want to achieve, I can then really use the arm both for static balancing, but also for dynamic balancing. And by having this additional momentum that I can generate with the arm, I can become a lot more reactive and also like balance some of the angular momentum that is injected through the offset between the, where the ground reaction forces apply and the base. And by that, keep the main body a lot more uh, horizontal. Then what is also important is that we can include all the constraints uh, that we uh, have in our system. So you see here a pushing task and on the left-hand side, we do not consider any torque limitations that we have in our individual joints, while on the right-hand side, we do. And we see that here, if you look at the torque that is necessary in order to push block here on the left, we have these peaks which go beyond the limit. While on the right-hand side, the robot really moves into a close to singular configuration and pushes the box uh, forward. And actually, that's also something that uh, we as human would do uh, quite naturally. If you want to push something in front of me, I would make a step back and uh, stretch out my arms and pull it forward in order to reduce uh, some of the joint torques I'm needing. You can also include uh, prehensile manipulation tasks, so where we have to throw objects and 
break or make contact with the environment, uh, which is defined like uh, the time it should be released and like uh, can optimize for throwing distance um, in, in different types of pushing or throwing tasks. Then we combine this cost function for different maneuvers. Uh, here uh, on the left-hand side, a standing task um, where you have a free motion at the base and want to move the end effector. On the right-hand side, where you have two tasks, both for the end effector and the base that move uh, together. The mass that is carried here is unobserved but you want to have, um, but the end effect of um, uh, reaction essentially compensates uh, for that, for this unmodeled uh, mass. Then you can start interacting with the environment, uh, opening doors, both in push or in pull direction, and essentially just command in our cost function, the desired door opening angle for both cases. And you see here in the first part where you have Jean-Pierre coming and interacting with the robot, um, that you pull it in the other direction, and then have the robot uh, compensated for this again and bringing it back to the desired uh, direction. So in this example, we were modeling the environment or the store as a one degree of freedom mass spring damper system and essentially measured the door state from uh, the end effect position. And now this allows us to compose more complex behaviors by just changing essentially the cost function, this is the parameters that we have, this alpha parameters that we have in the cost function over time. And by that, like maybe open the door, move through the door uh, and close it again. We'll also do other tasks like interacting with the environment. So this concludes this first part. And I hope it gave you a little bit of an overview of um, the fundamental methods that we are be running in, in our frameworks uh, with OCS2. In the second part, I would like to give some high-level glimpse on a couple of elements that I think are important, exciting, in, in, and make our systems um, move the way uh, they are moving. First part is so-called frequency aware MPC. So a method that allows us to include the non-ideal actuator dynamics uh, through a cost function checking. Um, the second uh, work is uh, learning complex cost functions uh, by David. And we did a lot of uh, feedback policy optimization. So if you look at your SRQ algorithm that is on slide here on the right, you do not only get your reference behavior, but at the same time, you also get your feedback behavior. And now what you can do is depending on um, the time in your behavior, you might want to be a, a lot more stiff or a lot more compliant uh, to cope with disturbances. So we do also optimize for this feedback policy there. Then we do uh, model predictive interaction control. Um, this is, for example, a uh, showcase down here, where we here, in essence, um, identify the, the model of the object we're interacting with. Um, we did try different aspects or different methods, like model application adaptive control, or model reference uh, adaptive control, which all of them result essentially in, in the model that you have want to control at the end effector, and you include this into your whole MPC formulation. And I would like to highlight a little bit and how we can compress this MPC in neural networks in order to achieve a much more efficient uh, execution. How we can include safety via control barrier functions, which was a collaboration with our names group. Um, how we can include stochasticity, uh, how we can combine offline motion libraries with online MPC to become a lot more agile. And then lastly, how we can include collision avoidance in MPC. So no worries, I will not uh, go into details of all of this work. For the bold ones, I will highlight a couple of elements. For the other ones, uh, I would like to guide the interested reader uh, to the corresponding publications uh, or videos that are online. So let me first start with this frequency of our MPC. So one of the issues that we are facing um, in all of our control is that we're modeling our system as a multi-body dynamics, um, an ideal multi-body dynamics thing. And we assume that the torque we're generating is actually the torque that moves our system. However, in an actual robotic system, we have an actuator and obviously this actuator is not perfect. We cannot perfectly track the torque command and provide it. So there's two ways in how you could overcome that. One way is that you now explicitly model your actuator and you bring this into your uh, MPC formulation, 
which can blow up the problem uh, quite a bit. And it's not that clear in how you should model this architecture. The second method that uh, Ruben was working on was in essence that we are shaping the uh, cost function in a frequency domain, such that we penalize in high frequency input, which reduces the, the closed loop sensitivity and permits a uh, much higher uh, model uncertainty. Um, in implementation, this is done by a state uh, augmentation in, in time domain. And what in essence it does is smoothing um, your, uh, uh, your, your commands that you're giving to the system. So what you see here in this plot is your ground um, reaction force. Uh, if you smoothen the cost function, you see that the desired one in red is getting a lot smoother and hence a lot more easy to follow by the actual system. While if you don't smoothen the cost function, you make contact with the environment, you have an immediate change of your model dynamics because of changing constraint. And this immediately changes uh, um, to a very high force, which is hard uh, to track. And that is then also enabling us to move on compliant ground, which obviously is also not modeled in, in your whole system dynamics. Now, so far we were moving blind. Uh, in this uh, second work, we were including then feasible terrain patches, so areas where the robot can step into our MPC formulation. So we have an environment interpretation module that in essence, uh, figures out what kinds of terrain patches exist, which are flat that I can step on, and then takes these as constraints, as terrain constraints, both in the MPC layer using a control barrier function, but then also in the whole body controller, such that the robot um, steps within this safe uh, terrain patch. If you execute this on the actual system, uh, you can have here a robot trotting on uh, stepping stones, the terrain is, in this case, pre-mapped. We get a lot of uh, feasible terrain patches. You shrink these terrain patches to have some safety and then have the planner, depending on the input command and how the base should be moving, select to which patch it should step and then move across. Now, this only handles constraints at the foothold. If you want to move with the system in challenging environments, we also want to satisfy constraints at the base. So imagine the robot moving through narrow passages that, where it should not collide with the environment. Um, you can do this on the navigation level, but if you go back to this initial plot, you understand that navigation is typically executed with a lot lower frequency. And if you have changes in your environment, if the robot does not move exactly as planned, you want to handle these constraints uh, at the MPC level. So what we are doing here is that we were modeling the environment using a science distance field and then abstracted the robot itself using a number of spheres. Um, it can also be other uh, ellipsoids or something. And from these spheres, make sure that these don't collide with the environment. The MPC is extended to the following. So we have the MPC node that has now access to a compound environment composed of a static uh, environment from the STF and the dynamic environment, which is fed from a Vox block server uh, that maps and an obstacle uh, tracker that runs at a lot higher frequency. And this then asynchronously update here the compound environment such that we are not influencing the MPC uh, execution. The MPC itself, um, exactly the same as you've seen before. Uh, we're optimizing certain cost functions such as dynamics, friction cones, and effective velocity using OCS2. Now, what is special in here is that we extend it with additional costs that are uh, ensuring that you have a collision uh, free motion. So cost terms that include the distance between all the spheres and their environment uh, have a certain safety boundary, and this is included as one sided quadratic uh, barrier functions. Interestingly, if you include that, the computational time of your system is increased a little bit, but not uh, massively, and it allows you now to, to move the robot through narrow passages if the main body gets getting too close to its environment. Um, these constraints become active and make sure that you're not colliding uh, with the environment. 
Now, similarly to this, you can also include uh, self-collision. So assume you want to have a robot that uh, crashed something on the ground. Uh, if you would not have any self-collision, you just collide here with uh, the main body. So what you're doing here is directly from the URDF model, generate the collision bodies and have this flexible collision body library that queries for the closed distances includes that um, uh, into the optimization. And if you do so, um, you can have then the robot moving around, uh, doing different uh, maneuvers and the body pose itself is just naturally adapted to the motion that you want to do with the end effect while ensuring that you don't have a collision uh, with the main body. The next element I want to just briefly browse through is uh, MPC net. So what you have seen now is model predictive control allows us to do a lot of things, but at the same time, we have to admit that it is computationally quite involved. So we can only run this with a limited frequency. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at, for example, an RL algorithm that just trains a neural network offline, the execution is then a lot, lot faster than this MPC algorithm and doesn't require that much computational load. So the idea here was that we combine these two things uh, together. Uh, so we take, um, we use the MPC solver in order to demonstrate um, to learn controller. Now what people most of the time do is that they just do uh, behavior cloning. So trying to optimize or to clone the, the complete behavior of the system. What we do here is that we bend back to the first principles of uh, optimal control and essentially Note from there that what the optimal solution is doing is minimizing a Hamiltonian. So we can take this Hamiltonian uh, as a policy loss function and then uh, apply this MPC in order to do all this uh, habitual uh, data generation where we store uh, these Hamiltonians and uh, all relevant uh, terms in a replay buffer and then during policy search, uh, randomly sample from these. There's a couple of uh, tricks that have to be applied to that. If you're interested in these ones, uh, check out the two papers by Jan and Alexander. The result is uh, pretty nice. So with like few minutes of MPC, you can generate enough data uh, to like train a policy. And this policy evaluates on the actual system a lot faster. And you can actually achieve uh, pretty high robustness uh, with that. So you see here, I dropped the gate uh, where Alexander is pulling and pushing the robot around, it's just uh, dynamically reactive. What is nice is that you can now take an MPC which runs at much higher frequency than what you'd actually be able to execute in the system and use that in order to train um, these policies. Now, the last element I want to show you here is how we can combine now this MPC planner and the inverse dynamics based tracking method together with on offline motion planning in order to generate uh, very complex behaviors. So, what this is doing is that we, at a first level uh, offline, we generate a desired motion which figures out in like when to step, where to step, even a complex description uh, of our environment. Um, we know we can do this in, in real time, online and on board. So we do this offline and we generate uh, a motion library from this. So a potential trajectory optimizing here would be tower. And then during online execution, you just draw from this motion library and you compose the behavior online that you then track with your MPC. So this looks as follows. You have uh, your environment that you map somehow and you wanna go from a start to goal location. So you first run your optimal, uh, your offline uh, trajectory um, optimizer that generates the way how you're moving, times when you and the locations where you have to step. In during execution, what you're then doing is essentially you are following this optimized trajectory using the MPC controller, and this MPC controller optimizes both the desired uh, motion but also the desired uh, commands that they're giving in there, such that we're following this as well as possible. So we don't have to readapt this offline trajectory, but only the MPC makes sure that even if I have a lot of model uncertainties that I have included, or model inaccuracies that I have included in this offline trajectory, you're still able to more or less uh, follow that and locally optimize the behavior to overcome uh, certain obstacles. And this is now more or less the basis uh, for different types of complex behaviors that we can uh, generate, where it can compose all kinds of different maneuvers. 
And for those of you who have seen also the Boston Dynamics uh, recent dancing videos, um, it's very similar to, to what you see here. So a lot of offline optimization that can generate more complex behavior than online synthesis and tracking using um, MPC and, and, and whole body controllers. Uh, now with this, uh, I would like to end my uh, presentation uh, and thank you all for attending. Obviously this was not work of myself, but work of uh, a big and excellent team that I had the pleasure to work with. And uh, I would also close here highlighting one last time again, uh, OCS2 tutorial by Parbot during this workshop, if you wanna uh, understand a little more the details uh, behind what I was presenting today. This I'm stopping here and uh, thank you all for listening. All right, thank you uh, once again. This was a fantastic uh, talk to see all the, the super interesting work you're doing. Um, so I guess at this point, uh, if we have some time, uh, we'd love to have a bit of open Q&A from the audience. So I, I'll try to curate this as best I can in the virtual setting. And we can either do, um, if, you, if you'd like to speak up, please uh, click the raise hand button and then we'll unmute you. Um, otherwise you can also type into the chat window and I'll sort of read these out loud. So um, questions for Marco in the audience. Okay. So we have our first question from uh, Jamie. You can go ahead. Yes. Hi. Hey, Marco. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great presentation. I, I have a question in regards of uh, stability. Do you include some additional constraints for stability? I see that you are using really uh, super polygons, but I was thinking more about uh, zero dynamics, or any of these kind of things to make the motion some more agile or more dynamic. So in the, the first part of my presentation, I tried to outline this a little bit. Uh, if you do this sequential optimization and if you use very simplified templates, then this zero uh, CMP optimization is really something that a lot of people are doing. And there you explicitly have to be included. Now, if you do this uh, whole body optimization where you include the full centroidal dynamics, you have essentially included this in your optimal control problem. Um, if you would be flat and you would ensure um, uh, the base would not be moving, you would generate pretty much the same behavior as with the CMP template. But obviously this also extends uh, to the various different types of environments where the CMP model simplification would not hold anymore. Thank you so much. Okay, other questions from the audience? Feel free to raise your hand or ask in the chat. Okay, so we have one in the chat window. Um, how do you model the actuator dynamics? I think it's the, the gist of the question in the chat. Um, we did try different things. Uh, what I presented here today with this uh, frequency of our MPC, you're not really modeling them. All you're doing is we are estimating what is the rough bandwidth that we have to punish such that the actuator is still able to track. So to make sure that we're not generating high frequency commands that the actuator is not able to track. We did also try other things where we explicitly modeled um, the, the actuator itself, like using simplified um, second or first order models and included that and into the, the MVC fashion. And there's a third way in how you are doing this, and I think this one is something that we should have a look a lot more in the future, is that we essentially modeled the actuator from data. There's a lot of things in actuators which is very hard to model from first principles. You have uh, saturations at different places which you may not really uh, be able to capture from first principles on the electric circuits and the mechanics of it. You have things like time delays, uh, which are very hard to understand. So what you could do is you just take data on a test bench or on the actual system, and you figure out what is the input output behavior through this data. It can be, for example, approximated through a neural network, and you then may be able to include that in your MPC formulation such that you are able to like really compensate or cope 
with a lot more complex actuator dynamics. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, more questions from the audience. And I actually, in the meantime, I have a sort of related, maybe higher level version of this question that I was wanting to ask you, especially during the beginning of your talk when you talked a lot about modeling. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, most of these systems, we use very simplified models in these kind of hierarchical ways. And the models have gotten, as you alluded to, more complex over time as, you know, computers have gotten faster. I'm wondering, do you feel that like if the computers were arbitrarily fast, would you just sort of model everything and have a full body model in there, uh, the whole dynamics make it sort of super complicated? Or do you feel that there's uh, some sweet spot of model complexity that's sort of the right place to be? And a related question to this is, you know, based on where you are now with your models, what's the one you know, thing that you would like to model better from where you are now? Um, so for the first one, I, I don't think that we should make the models arbitrarily complex because the problem is the more complexity you bring in there, the more non-linearity we include and the harder it will be to find the right optimal solution to do it. So templates in that sense help a lot to bring you to the right optimum. Now, what you could do is you could uh, have this in a hierarchical fashion. That's also what uh, like a lot of uh, people are doing, right? You have a, a planner, which has a longer time horizon, includes more information about the environment, but has a lot simpler uh, model description, which still captures some of the most important aspects. And then the closer you go to the actual execution, uh, the more uh, in, you include into your uh, systems. And that's also what happens right now with these uh, um, like central dynamics in the MPC together with the full kinematics. And then you have the underlying whole body controller, which is in essence a, a single time step optimal controller that includes all the uh, constraints that you can think of, but it only looks ahead of time for one time step. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that we should go a lot more uh, complex, uh, like the answer or the, the, the answer to my answer in the chat uh, that we should look at data-driven actuator models. I think that's where we still have to invest a lot of time. So right now, uh, people doing optimal control, we, a lot of people are still far away from the actual physical system. So people should work a lot more with physical systems because then you understand the, the real problem. And these are a lot very often in, in the actuators. What, me, what that happens if you don't model the actuator accurately, but you assume that it's just perfect, is that you either make your system extremely conservative or you overdimension the robot massively. You just make an actuator that is good enough in the area where you want to operate or ideal enough in the area where you want to operate. If you want to push our systems to the limits, uh, to really the boundaries of what the actuators can do, I think then we have to have a lot more domain knowledge or model knowledge of the actuator included in the NPC. And this is not, in my understanding, not yet happening to the full extent, and particularly in, in, in like robotic systems. All right, thanks. Uh, so questions from the audience are very welcome. Feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat window. And... So I've got a related question going off of, uh, uh, off of Zach's question. Um, to what extent right now is computation like the limit of as far as like pushing forward to um, to getting more performance or more robustness out of your system is like is is the computational performance on the system like one of the most like like the bottleneck for you or is it more kind of algorithmic or trying to figure out how to kind of deal with disturbances um, and I guess I really just a out of curiosity like what type of computation are you using on the system and what to like to what extent are you leveraging parallelization, these kind of tricks to kind of mitigate that computational expense? Um, so we're, to start from the, the back, uh, we're using a, a full-fledged uh, like computer Intel or a new uh, type of system. It's a, an Intel processor, uh, i7, uh, which is pretty much used for the these optimizations that we're running here. I think what people are doing, yes, we are at the limit of what our, what compute, from a computational perspective. So whenever we can make it a little faster, gain um, 10 more Hertz here or 10 more Hertz there, the system is getting more robust. 
Uh, right now, um, as you've seen in some of the numbers, it's like a few tens of hertz to hundreds of hertz. And that's where you have to be, like below 50 hertz. It's getting very tricky to have the MPC being like the, the controller for this type of model or uh, system dynamics that we're uh, looking at. So the faster we can run this, uh, the better we are. And that's also why the electrobotics community uh, probably has a big split between people think just make it as fast as possible and use a simple model versus others which include more complex model, but then you suffer a little bit in timing. So if you could run our more complex robot, uh, more complex dynamics with a few hundreds of hertz, I think systems would become uh, a lot more uh, capable in that sense. And maybe, I don't know, like other people, Farbot or so, if you want to add to some of my statements, uh, feel free to. I think that pretty much. All right. Works. So we have, it looks like we have a question from Michael. Thanks for the great talk, Marco. Um, looking at that hierarchy you presented at the beginning of the talk, right? Um, do you feel like you sort of have the best choice there, or do you feel like there are um, some hard decisions you have to make as to which block of your whole stack is solving which sub problem? Um, I think a lot of this hierarchy is also coming from the type of uh, feedbacks that we have in our system. So type of sensors, how fast we can do run a state estimator, how fast we can run a mapping algorithm, to what level uh, this uh, is injected. If we could run our MPC as fast as possible, such that we would not need the, the whole body control level, we could possibly get rid of that and just have uh, one uh, thing in there, but that would mean that a lot of the constraints that are now just satisfied in the whole body controller would be, uh, we would have to cover uh, in our MPC formulation, also there increase again, uh, model complexity. On the- Are you that that's so, possible? I think that's possible, yes. I'm not sure if you want it and if it's the best solution, but possible uh, for sure it will be. Okay, thanks. Um, Dong Yu. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Cool. Uh, I have a question about the RL reinforcement learning versus MPC. So whenever we open the contact sequence in trajectory optimization, the difficulty uh, is just quantum jump. It's a lot more difficult than, you know, the problem we give the, the all the context sequence. But I know that the, your other work using the reinforcement learning make a lot of complex context to make a, you know, the animal stands up again. It looks like RL is more comfortable to solve that optimization problem with the open contact sequence. But I, I want to know that the, your explanation or any opinion about this. Um, I, I think you're right to a large extent. Um, if, you, if you go to very complex uh, terrain, we encountered a lot of corner cases using uh, this classical MPC fashion because you have compliant ground, slippery ground, uh, things that are very, very hard to model. And your model, as you said, assumes open or closed contact, and it doesn't include uh, contact dynamics there at all. Um, if I look at our best MPC controllers and at the same time at our most robust RL-based controllers and I put them into the most challenging terrain today, uh, the RL-based controller is more robust. Um, I don't think that this is uh, a problem that is, necess uh, is by definition not solvable through MPC. Um, there's a lot of research should be done in these directions and to, to make this uh, a lot more robust also under these types of conditions. It, it's not a, a, a deciding answer uh, to your question, but I think that's what, what like the whole community right now uh, is trying to figure out which directions uh, offer more opportunities and which directions may have the limits in, in what sense. Great, thank you. Uh, then you. Uh, hello. 
Hi, Marco. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question. So in your talk, you mentioned uh, in several places, like you are using MPC primarily to uh, design the controller. But you know, I always have this question myself, like as a human, when I move around, like I say on even uh, ground, I don't even need to think about, right? So I think like when you run MPC, like you mentioned in the later part of your talk, you mentioned that it's very costly to do all those calculations. But I just feel like as a human, when we do some of the stuff, it seems like it's not that mentally challenging to think about the motions of each of the joint. I think probably you lure to the research direction, like you are you trying to use neural network to kind of uh, figure out uh, way that can reduce the computational load on board. Um, but even for that, I just feel like you still need to have like working controller in the first place. And then you have to, let's say, train your new network for like weeks and even months to enable to make it to work, right? So I just feel like, is there a better way you think, you know, we can make it to work? Well, make it less computational expensive. Uh, I mean, following your argumentation, the MPC net part of the work that I presented here would, would actually be that, right? So you have a solver, but then you store it or encode it in, in a neural network that at runtime, you only draw the right solution uh, out of it and you're not running an online optimization in that sense. So that would be a combination of it. I'm not sure if I fully uh, agree that uh, we are not doing any uh, model-based control. I think we're doing a lot of model-based control in particular if we are uh, interacting with objects, not only with our own model, but also with models that we have uh, from our environment. I, I don't think that we are solving an SLQ problem in our brain and then um, execute this. Uh, I don't think so, but uh, it's just a different way in how this is embedded and obviously we have a brain which is much more closer to a neural network. So it must be a different way of how this optimization is solved. Uh, I'm not the specialist or the expert in this area to have this discussion. I think there's other people that are a lot more knowledgeable uh, to discuss this in more detail. So you think like in our brain, we still have this kind of model for our body, then, you know, even though we didn't think about it, we are still using the models of our system to control our body. I think certain models we have. I don't think that we have uh, this multi-body dynamics model that I presented today. Thank you. This is a tough question. I would love to hear the answer of some of the other experts here in the call. <laughs> So if anyone wants to speak up uh, on that topic, that I would be super interested also. Uh, there's a, a quick question in the um, in the chat uh, on whether there's any sort of notion of power management in your optimization, uh, particularly with complex terrain, I guess. But do you, do you reason about power consumption in any of these formulations? Um, so the answer to this question is yes, but this has not been presented today. So what you're doing a lot is like figuring out what types of terrain need less power to, to, to navigate over. And then you plan your navigation based on certain costs that you would have. And these costs can include power in terms of uh, energy consumption, but they may also include costs in terms of uh, risk of failure and, and things like that. So there you try to balance uh, this. Um, in here, we were also playing around with different uh, cost functions on MPC level, which uh, can optimize uh, the, the actual power that the system draws, but it's not an explicit cost function of like um, current times uh, voltage or something that you have uh, in your actuator. It's more abstract level uh, cost functions that you include there. Thanks. So if, if there's, I might selfishly steer the conversation in a slightly different direction. Uh, there's no other questions at the moment. Um, there's one, there's so, one. Oh, okay, good. Uh, just a question for uh, what would you have to change for, for bipeds or humanoids? Um, so I think the framework as is would directly translate to a biped or humanoid. The question is now what is the, uh, the level of complexity of this humanoid, whether or not you can solve it the same uh, model complexity as uh, we have it here, because obviously humanoid 
as again a lot more degrees of freedom and what it also change a lot is the, the contact constraint. Uh, if you would take a, an agility CASI robot, then uh, you could probably directly apply this because the, the contact constraints there are not that different. But if you have like ankle joints that contribute a lot to the, the overall um, stability of your system, then you would have to adapt uh, a bit. Cool. So now I'll ask my uh, slightly, which is related to this actually. I'm wondering, you, you've spoken a, quite a bit about hardware, especially in the beginning and just now. And I'm wondering, uh, especially with regard to some of the robustness and frequency dependent stuff you talked about, where the sort of line is between hardware design and, and algorithms, and do you design hardware, uh, do you see hardware designs being influenced by the control algorithms and sort of things going that direction, which I think is really interesting in a lot of cases. And, and you know, often as control engineers, we, we take a system and try to control it, but I think there's uh, a lot of potential back and forth and as someone who also works with a lot of hardware i'm curious where you what your take is on this so i think in the early days of electrobotics people have really tried to build the systems to match the templates as accurate as possible and not necessarily because the templates were the most efficient way of moving because the templates were the ones i understood in control and could then use in order to control my complete system i don't like this um, i think we should use our understanding of the models in order to optimize our system designs, but not necessarily because we can then control it because we have that model, but because the performance might be better for our system. So the approach that we're following here is uh, two folds, or in our group in general is two folds. In one side, we're trying to optimize the, the system itself, but without looking too much in how to control, and at the same time to have the control, which is generic enough that if I change my limb mass, my geometry, and it doesn't look like uh, an inverted pendulum anymore, you're still able to take the exact same framework, adapt the model, and have a, a decent controller uh, that, uh, that runs it. So uh, a slightly, I guess, different version of this is, so you talked you know, about uh, high frequencies being you know, you know, poorly modeled. This is kind of a standard thing, right? And, and wanting to have some sort of low pass filtering in the controller. What about putting low pass filtering in the hardware, like in the form of series elasticity, like you talked about? Does that sort of play into this anywhere? I think it's very important that you have this. You need some compliance at some point, otherwise something breaks. Because you have an impulsive load. If everything is rigid, you get like uh, infinite uh, positive forces that can break your gears. Now the question is where do you implement this? Uh, if you have a series elastic actuator, you have this somehow embedded in on, on joint level um, that you have direct the protection mechanism uh, included in there. At the same time in series elastic, the spring is very uh, often used as just these four force controllable element and the force sensor that you have there because you have a high gear reduction in the back. So you cannot just do uh, proprioceptive uh, torque control, like controlling the motor current without uh, having an output force measure. Um, other ways, and this is probably mostly done uh, these days in, in all legged systems, is that you have anyway certain compliance in your, your limbs, and you have probably even a dedicated compliance uh, in your feet. This compliance is mostly uh, coming for, from multiple facts. Uh, one fact is certainly that you want to design your system lightweight and you're not optimizing for uh, necessarily for stiffness and rigidity. So if you look at the old school industrial robot arms, uh, they just made as rigid as possible in order to follow my end effect trajectory independent of the payload. And that makes it dangerous when you collide because you have like all of that non-compliant behavior that kills you. In a legged system, we don't care about that at all. So you can make the system a lot more compliant. It also helps you in protecting uh, the, the overall structure of your system. I think where people are still struggling and you see like research attempts and then some people discard it again is how we engineer the right mechanical compliance into our system to make the system move more efficient or move fast. So we know from biomechanics that uh, we are using a lot of the elasticity in our muscle tendon system to store energy, release energy, uh, and, and that enables us to run. It's very tricky to include the right uh, 
uh, efficiency or the right stiffness into your system. You can do this for one gate and for one behavior in a simplified model, but then you want to have this versatility and you have to be optimal for whatever you're doing. And that's where the, the limits are today. So I haven't seen like a, a very impedant style or very variable stiffness style robot that is able to optimally exploit stiffnesses at the different operational points and still is able to be controllable. No that was a really interesting <laughs> uh, area uh, that I've been super interested in. I guess I think we're out of time. So thanks again so much uh, and for, for taking the time to talk with us. And we look forward to seeing you at the panel discussion on the 13th. And um, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming out uh, to hear Marco speak. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening or day. Thank you so much.